Okay, uh, hi everyone, I'm Gregor. Uh, I will be talking about building, writing simple DSLs in Ruby. Uh, I work for this. Okay. I'm going to do this and now. Okay, thanks. I work for this company called Caligo Travel Solutions. We are building uh, different products that, that are related to traveling and to loyalty, uh, to loyalty currencies. So today I'll be working. Uh, today I'll be talking about something that is closely related to what I what I've been working on uh, recently. Uh, uh, when I when I was preparing this talk, I've noticed that there were related talks recently here in in Singapore. Uh, one of them was at the Ruby meetup, I think, two months ago, and it was about writing a DSL, uh, which was very different from the DSLs that I will be uh, I will be showing you. Uh, but you could you could check it as well. And the second one was at the Red Dot Ruby conference last month, and it was a talk about about metaprogramming, uh, which is very useful to understanding how you can uh, how can you can write DSLs in Ruby. Uh, so first, uh, first of all, I, I guess that you know what DSLs are. Like it, this, this abbreviation stands for Domain Specific Language, and uh, that's where the easy part ends because. To understand what really is DSL is not so easy. Like wh when, I, when I show you a language, it's not easy to determine if you can call it DSL or not. Uh, so first example, first example which is easy is, is a make. It's a tool uh, for building programs, for compiling, for executing some programs. And uh, make itself uh, parses files that are written in, in certain language. And this language was created only to be parsed by this program and only to be understood by this program. So it's definitely a, uh, a domain-specific language. Then we've got CSS, which I don't think that anyone thinks of it as a, as a domain-specific language, but it's, it is a language, and it has just one domain. It, 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 it has only one application, right? It is supposed to be parsed by a browser and uh, to, to format the content that, that the browser displays. Then the third example, this is more complicated. Uh, so Vim, the text editor, has built-in language that is called VimScript. And I'm not sure if it's a DSL or not, and I will explain you why in a moment. Then we've got uh, the last two examples here are uh, languages specific, kind of specific to Ruby. So first one is Gherkin. It's a language that is understood by a library called Cucumber, which is, uh, which is a testing framework. And then the, the last one, I, I think all of you know what is RSpec, and that the RSpec syntax doesn't really feel like Ruby syntax. Uh, so it's, it's, it's also a DSL. Uh, so, so the first one, first example that I mentioned was, uh, was make, and I'm sure that whoever of you ever written uh, some more complex program in C or C++, something more complex than just one file, you know that it's a it's not easy to link all these files to to compile them one by one, etc. So we use the tool called uh, called Make, and it reads the file called Make uh, file called Make file, and this Make file uh, is written in a DSL that has some uh, that has certain constructs that that a language may have. Uh, in this case, we've got rules and macros. So it's a very simple language. It has just two basic constructs. There are no more uh, no more constructs in this language. Uh, then Vimscript, Vim script, which I mentioned that is more complex, it's actually a, like a full language. It has variables, it has loops, uh, it has the if conditional, etc., etc. You can write a full program in Vimscript. The thing is that you will not use it anywhere outside of Vim. You will just use it. Uh, I, I haven't seen any example of Vimscript being used to s for something different than extending the, the Vim editor. So I, I'm not really sure if it's a DSL because it's like a, it's a full language. You can write any program in VimScript, but on the other hand, it has just one application. Now, DSLs can be uh, can be either external or internal, and uh, this this is uh, this is a huge difference because uh, the internal internal DSL is limited to the language in which it is written. So even though RSpec code, the RSpec code that you are writing, doesn't feel like Ruby because you do not define directly any methods or classes, uh, it still needs to be a valid Ruby syntax. And, and the code that you write in this DSL is simply a part of the program that you are executing. While the external DSLs, like for example CSS, are parsed 
and executed by some, by some external program. So CSS is not a, uh, CSS doesn't have to be written in the same language than the program using it is written. Okay, and the last one, uh, the last one, the last example is Gherkin. So uh, I think that I have example of Gherkin here. Yes, uh, I'm not sure if you see it well. Uh, but Gherkin is not a valid Ruby syntax. If you try to parse Gherkin, if you try to pass this block on the left by, by Ruby parser, it will tell you that it's invalid. Uh, and on the other hand, you've got a library called CUDA, which is, uh, which is an alternative to Gherkin. So you can use Cucumber with, with both of them. Uh, and one of them is the external DSL, because it needs to be parsed. It cannot be parsed as a Ruby code. Uh, while CUDA, even though it does the same, uh, it, is, it is a valid Ruby code. And therefore, it is easier, because you do not need to write a specific parser for it, so it's easier uh, to, to, uh, to use some uh, such language. But on the other hand, it is not as nice. Like the, the, the first one, the Gherkin on the left, looks much, much easier to read, especially for non-programmers. Uh, this is some internal DSL that looks, uh, the first line looks almost like SQL language, just a very weird type of SQL, but actually this is a valid Lisp code. So uh, I, I think it's written in, in common Lisp. Uh, so Lisp is extremely flexible language and it allows you to define, to build a DSL that doesn't really look like Lisp. Uh, well, it probably you recognize that it is Lisp because of the parentheses. Uh, but, but it doesn't feel like, uh, like very much Lispy code. And it allows, uh, it allows you to build something like this. And the second one, uh, it looks very easy because it's just a, a loop, which we know from lots of other languages. But Lisp doesn't have native loop structure. This is actually a DSL that is written in the language itself. So this is something that I, I don't think that you could achieve something like this in Ruby. But I don't know, maybe, maybe someone tried to implement the for loop and not using the, the native for loop in Ruby. Okay, so once again, the external DSL is like a separate language. It is not part of the language which is, which is, which is reading it. Uh, so it is easy to use, uh, sorry, it is, it is more difficult to use because you need to write a parser of this language. You need to write a separate program that will parse your language, but it is extremely flexible. You can define any grammar rules. You can define the language to look whatever you want, uh, you want it to look like. Uh, on the other hand, the internal DSLs are limited because they need to be a valid syntax of the language uh, that hosts this DSL. But because of that, it is, it is much easier to define the internal DSL because you don't have to write a, write a parser for it. So if you check the RSpec code, it doesn't have any specific parser. It, the RSpec code is just parsed by the same Ruby parser that you use for, for running your programs. Now, in, in Ruby, there are basically three components that you need to understand uh, in order to start building, building DSLs. The first one is a block. Uh, and I think that everyone using Ruby knows, well, knows what a block is. Uh, the second one is executing the block in different contexts. So you can, use, uh, you can use the keyword yield here that just executes the block that you pass to a function. You can use the instance exec, uh, instance evil, or you can use block.call. I will explain the difference between the instance exec and instance evil soon. And the last concept is uh, metaprogramming. So you need to just understand very basic uh, very basic components of metaprogramming in Ruby, like define method, which allows you to define a new method uh, basically from, s fr from string. So you define a method from a, from a data, not from a, from a piece of code. And the last one, which is met method missing, which is basically a function that is executed when you try to call a function that doesn't exist in your code. There's, of course, more uh, about metaprogramming in Ruby. and if you don't know how it works, you should definitely check one of the, one of the talks that I mentioned earlier. OK, uh, now I will show you uh, a few very, very simple DSLs, and I will explain you how they, how they work. I will not be writing DSLs. I already have the code.
Is it big enough? No? OK, uh, so first I want you to just focus on this. Uh, so this is my DSL. I want to I want to basically copy factory girl, but instead of do it in 300 or 400 lines of code, I want to do it in 50 lines of code. Uh, so basically, I want to b I want to be able to define factories uh, that will be used later for testing, so that I can easily create the user, like you know, uh, or, or or some other object. Normally, if I want to create an an object for for uh, the purpose of my test, I need to do like you know user dot new and pass all the parameters that are required. Uh, and in order to uh, to make it simpler, I just want to have a factory that will already fill this user object with the default uh, with with some default uh, values of the parameters. Okay, so I define the factory called called user, and later I will do something like factory. Okay, and this is my DSL. It just needs to consist of two public functions. So. Uh, Let's start by, by how, uh, how this define method works, and then I will explain how, how create works. Okay? So uh, my class factory has just uh, has one variable, in, uh, uh, one internal variable called factory, so that I will keep the collection of, co of created factories. And when, when I define a factory, what I do is that I take the name, and I create a new factory that will have this name. So this one will be called user, and it will have some body. The body, body here is a block. So I'm passing this block here, all these three lines, I'm passing to this function under the name block. And now, now we have this function called initialize. So first what I do is uh, I need to know what kind of object this, uh, this factory, this specific factory, will be creating. So I'm taking my name, which is the uh, symbol user. I'm, cha I'm changing to string. I capitalize it, so, I, so the first letter is a capital letter. And then I try to get the constant from there. Uh, of course, if this constant is not defined, then, then my factory will fail. And now here's, here's where, where, the, where the magic happens. Here's where, where I need to use the instance evil, one of the methods that I mentioned before. I basically take this body, the block, and I'm defining it, uh, I'm executing it inside, inside my factory. So I'm going line by line, and I'm just calling, I'm just calling something like this. I'm calling first name with the, para uh, with the value Michael. And now, what is first name? My factory here, which calls this block, doesn't have a method called first name. So what I'm doing is that right now, the method missing will be executed. And the method missing uh, tells me what name, what is the name of the function that I try to call, and with what, what parameters I try to call it. So in this case, the name will be first name, and these attributes will be an array with just one element, which will be Michael. So I'm assigning this, this value, Michael, to the default attributes hash that I have here under the key first name. And now it's the same with the other ones. Uh, I go through last name Jordan, and with this, uh, I'm going through this email. And now, after this, my default attributes, which started as an empty hash, is filled with all these three values. So it looks like, uh, like this. So these are my default attributes. Okay, and now that's it. That's, that's, that's what this function does. That's what defining factory does. And now my factory is ready, and it's added to the store, this small storage of factories. So when I call this method here, when I call factory.createUser, it just checks what is a factory registered under the name user, and it calls method create on it. And this method is extremely simple. It just creates a new object of this class that I saved before. And it initializes this object with default attributes or with attributes that I can, that I can uh, use to override it. OK, so this is, this is extremely simple. This, this DSL is just 26 lines of code. And it's a like very, basic, very, very basic version of, of Factory Girl. Now, 
I have a similar example here that doesn't use, let me show them next to each other. This example here uh, doesn't use instance, uh, instance evil. It uses yield instead. And now, uh, also, my, also my factory will look a bit different here in this case. My DSL, as you see, takes, uh, takes one argument to a block. And now, uh, and now I call the first name, last name, and email on this attribute. What is this attribute? What am I passing here? I'm passing self. So I'm passing to the block, I'm passing factory as a, under the name f. And then I call factory.firstname, factory.lastname, and factory.email. Now, why, that, why do I need to do it this way? Uh, let, me show you, let me show you how both of them will work, and then you will see the difference. Okay, so I create my factory user, uh, and it works. And here I, I have one change. Instead of passing the string here, I will want to pass my last name. So I have, a, I have an instance variable called last name. And as you see, what happens here is that my last name is nil. So why, why, why is it nil? It's nil because I call this thing ins, uh, using instance evil. And instance evil executes the block that I passed in my current context. Uh, and the current context here is the factory object. So now, this block, what happens here in this block is that self is the factory object. And the factory object doesn't have an instance variable called last name. Okay? So in this case, uh, using instance evil, I am not able to use the variables that are, that are outside, uh, that are outside of, of my context here, of this factory. Instead, if I had, the, if I had variable called last name here, this would work. Because this variable exists then in the context of this factory. So this is a limitation of, of instance evil. And now, if I do the same, if I do the same using the, the yield, This works fine. See that the, the last name is here. That's because that's because this this block is still executed in its normal context. So yield the difference between yield and an instance evil is that yield just doesn't change the context of the block. It uses the context in which the block was initially created. While instance evil it kind of overwrites self. Okay. So this is one example. Uh, this is one example of a of a very simple DSL. Now, uh, there is one more there is one more method like like these two that I mentioned uh, mentioned a moment ago, and the, the last one is called instance exec. And instance exec is basically the same as instance evil. It also overwrites self, and the only difference is that it allows you to pass to pass arguments. So here, yield it allows me to pass itself as an argument. But I can also pass something else here. I can pass user or whatever I want to pass to this block as an argument. Uh, instance evil takes only one argument, which is a block. But if I do instance exec, then I can pass self as an argument. 
and only the last one the last argument is the block that I will be that I will be executing so here I can also define uh, like this I can do F uh, which will be the factory and I can I can have it like this okay uh, so to sum up this difference uh, you should use yield when you want to have access to the functions and variables from the original context where the block was created. Then instance exec, you should be using it when you want to have access to the current context, when you want to use variables or functions from the, from the object which will be calling the block, not the object that created the block. And instance evil, well, basically there is no reason to use it because it's the same as instance exec, except that it's limited. It doesn't accept the, it doesn't accept additional arguments. Okay. Uh, before I get to this question, I want to show you, uh, I want to show you another small, another small DSL. So, uh, I have this CSV generator. So uh, sometimes at Caligo we need to generate a lot of different files that we are sending later to our partners uh, because lots of companies that we work with, they do not have uh, REST APIs in their systems. How it works is that you generate a file, you send it to their SFTP or sometimes you have to upload it manually via web interface and then you wait three days and then they upload the uh, handbag file on your SFTP or they don't do that because they forget because there's lots of manual process involved there uh, so so we need to generate files and sometimes these files are in CSV format sometimes they are in fixed width format uh, which is basically the format where each row needs to have the same amount of characters in each line okay so here I, I just want to generate a very basic uh, very basic CSV file uh, and I, I accept the records or orders uh, as my as my argument to the object and I just define I have a small DF DSL that defines the header how how the first line of this CSV file will look like and I define the body and the body is different for each row for each order ha has its own has its own row has its own line in the file so now uh, now this DSL is also is extremely simple and it's just like 50 lines of code. So let's have a look how, on how, how, it, how it works. First thing that you may notice is that I'm including the CSV generator here. Uh, and when I include it, I just, I need to enable some instance and class methods. So to do it in Ruby, I need to include the instance methods module and I need to extend my current class with the class methods, uh, class methods module. So now class methods that I have here so this is a class method because, as you can see, it's this is called in the, uh, in the context of the class. So I've got a header and a body. And header, basically what it does is that it takes a block and it passes it to a class called part generator. And it happens, I I it's exactly the same, the same with body. So I just take this block, it's not executed right now, it's just captured and I pass it somewhere and I will execute it later when, I, when I'm generating the file. And the same with body. And now, the block that I'm passing to, header, to, to a header takes one argument, which will be the generator, the header generator, uh, because I don't need any additional information here. I'm only adding the columns with, the with, uh, with some uh, hard-coded strings. But the second one takes, takes additional argument, which is the order, because each row will have some information taken from this order. Okay, and now, my method, uh, sorry, my uh, my CSV generator has one method called uh, called generate. So I'm ordered, I'm calling something like this. Okay, and that method called generate basically executes the block first. It executes the block that I pass to the header generator and adds it to the CSV file in the beginning. And then it goes through all the records that I have, and for each of them, it calls the block that I passed to the body generator, passing this record there, and also it adds, add, adds it to this, to this CSV file. And now, what, what, what do this header generator and the body generator do? They are also, uh, also very simple. So my part generator that will later generate either the head or the body, 
may take a, uh, takes a block and it, it, co it has a collection of values. And this collection is initially empty. Uh, it needs to be an array because that's how CSV is represented. It's just an array uh, and each row in the CSV file is just an array of some values that are later connect or, uh, connected with comma or, uh, or some, some, some other character. And now when I call this block, uh, when I call this generator, I can take any, any number of arguments here. Uh, this is not so nice part because some block will take zero arguments, some block will take two arguments, but I cannot define it here. Here I need to take, uh, I need to, I need to be able to take any number of arguments, so I don't, don't have really control over that. And then I call the block that I, that I captured before, passing cell first, and, uh, and, then, and then I pass the, pass the, pass the arguments. And now what I do is that I go through these lines and I basically call it a generator.column. And here generator.column with address, here generator.column with price. And what happens is that when I call column method, it's executed here in, part, uh, in, this, in this generator. And, and this, this will, will give me an array. I will like ID, price, etc. And here I iterate over the records, and each of them generates one array of three elements. First element will be the order ID, second will be some, some string, and the third one will be, will be a total amount. Let me show you that it actually works. Uh, I've got this variable called orders here. Okay, and I've the output is one string that is just all this. This is the first row. Here we've got the new line. This is the second row. Here we've got once again new line and, and the, third, uh, the third row. So I just generated a valid CSV that string that I later can save can save to a file. Okay, and uh, here once again, uh, I use the block call block dot call. I'm calling the I'm calling the block here, uh, and I use this syntax where I'm passing the builder. I'm passing the builder here, and I'm calling I'm calling this method explicitly on a builder. That if I call it, if I call it this way, it's implicit that I will be calling it. Uh, I might be calling it in some different context, but here I just wanted to explicitly say that this column needs to be called needs to be called on a uh, on, on on this builder. So this is extremely uh, this is the same, but here I will be using sorry in the ah uh, yes no where where do I have it ah yes so here I just wanted to show that the uh, I can actually do do similar thing, uh, just just I can use yield and pass self instead of doing instead of doing block call. Oh, sorry, it's not this one. It's here. Uh, okay, yes, this one, this file. So here I was using block call, which is the same as yield. And here I'm using the instance exec, and I'm just I'm just passing first the arguments that I'm getting, and then then I'm passing the block. And here the DSL looks a bit different. It just doesn't take this this other uh, this other uh, argument to to a block. Okay, and the last example that I want to show you is is a config that I'm. Mm, that I'm often using in some applications when I when I need to do some uh, some configuration that I want don't want to keep in the database. Like, why wouldn't I keep the configuration in the database if if I can do it? Uh, first, because sometimes I've got configuration that changes extremely rarely, uh, and I just don't need to keep it in database. And the other reason is that my changes in database uh, are not tracked as well as the changes in the code. 
So whenever you change something in the database, it's already there. Whenever you change something in code, you need to push, you need to have code reviewed so that someone can notice that, hey, this change shouldn't be there. So I, I define a very simple configuration files that are just Ruby code. So this, is, this code on the left and the code on the right are exactly the same. Uh, and I just wrote a, a very small library, which is just one method that allows me to write it like this. Uh, so what it does is that the basic class, the, the, the class called application, defines three configuration values. The first one is root path. The second one is, uh, the second one is supported formats. The last one is authentication. And what happens here is that the root path doesn't have a default value. Therefore, if you try to call it, it will just, it will just raise an error. Uh, the same as, as you see here. The second one, called supported formats, has a default value, which is an array that consists of two elements. And the last one, the default value here is a block. So if you try to call it, it will just execute this code here. So my, by default, my application, when you call dot .authentication, it will return you false. But the admin application that inherits from that overrides this value. And when you try to call authentication, it will try to call a service called admin authentication. Now, how does this, uh, how does this one function work that I, that I mentioned you? It's basically one piece of a uh, very crappy code that should be hidden somewhere and not touched so that nobody sees how metaprogramming can be ugly and everyone just sees like, you know, how, how beautiful it looks like when, it, when it's being used. Uh, so it, it is terrible for many reasons. Uh, one of them is that it took me just like 20 minutes to write it. Uh, but the other is that uh, I wanted to, look to make it look very nice and very easy to use. Uh, so because of that, I need to, I need to do some, some ugly hacking here. Uh, so we have just one method called config. When you, when you call this method called config, it takes a, a name of the, of the configuration and it defines a singleton method. Define singleton method basically defines a class method. Okay, and it defines this method in a class. So if I, if I say config root path, then my class gets a method called root path. And if I call this method called root path, then I will define the method with the same name on an instance. Okay? So let me show you how this code works in practice. Oh no, it doesn't work in practice. Why doesn't it work in practice? Ah. Does work now? Yes. Okay, so I've got admin application dot new, which is my app now. And up, I can call root to root path. Uh, it should be up. Okay, so I've got. I basically create an instance of the class of the admin application class, and this this up this instance has access to the root path method. So if I call root path in context of a class, I just define the value, and then instances can can use this value. Okay, so this is this is an uh, extremely simple example of what you can what you can do in Ruby uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't even, I'm not even sure if it's a DSL. It's just, it's just a small change that doesn't look like Ruby anymore, but this is still, uh, this is still an example. This is still a, a working Ruby code, okay? So I'm, I'm using this just to make my configuration files more readable. I could do it using JSON, I could do it using YAML, but if I do it using JSON or YAML, I cannot override it with a, with a working code like this block here. If I do it in database, then other people can change the values and I don't have control over it, uh, unless, unless I add some triggers in the database that will inform me about it, etc. So this is how I write, how I, how I write config files that are both, uh, they are both pushed to the code and they are, both, uh, they are, they are also easily, easily extendable. Okay, uh, 
So these were the these were the examples that I wanted to show you today. And now the question is if these examples are re really really domain specific languages. I have some examples of random comments or by random people on the internet that are bitching around, uh, bitching about it, saying that oh it's not DSL because it's just syntax abuse and uh, the only real DSLs are in Lisp. Blah blah blah. Uh, he, he, here's some more. And one one comment that brought my attention was that it is. It is not really writing a DSL. You're not writing a new language. You are just abusing the existing syntax to make your code look like it's not written in this language. And then I thought that actually it's not an insult, that abusing language can be a beautiful thing. And uh, I wanted to show you some examples. So this is, uh, this is a valid Ruby code. This is a monad code, maybe, and it's a part of library code Kaisley, Kaisley. I don't even know how. Uh, I I don't know how to how to pronounce it. But what br what brings uh, what dr uh, what what draws my attention here? What what is unexpected is this operator that is the uh, greater than dash greater than characters. I tried to create method like this, and it's impossible. Ruby doesn't allow you to do it. So then, uh, like you know, I'm thinking like, wow. So I'm using a method that I cannot define. How did they do that? And it appears that these guys just created a method called greater than. It's just one character. And then they are this, this dash and greater than is a syntax for lambda. OK, so you see this code here, the, the li line 4, this line. Now, now look how it can look like also. It's this. So is it a DSL? I don't know. Is it abusing language? Definitely. Is it beautiful? I, I, I really love it. Uh, so it's it's example of something that Ruby allows you because it's so flexible. Other languages, except for Lisp, maybe not necessarily. Uh, another uh, another abusing of the language syntax is I it's the it's from the same library. Like I I didn't know that I could parse this code in Ruby, but actually you can you can do that. You do not have to put character dot character. You can put as many spaces between them as possible, and. I show you that it really that it really works. I I read about it just yesterday, and I'm still I'm still surprised. Uh, so let's say that I have a string, and I want to capitalize it, and it works. So you can just you can just write it like this, and 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 you can create the functions uh, with capital letters. So the first thing that uh, that you think of when you see a when you see a constant with capital letter is that it's a class, but maybe, but but it doesn't have to be. Oh no! Oh no! It doesn't work in this case. Now why? <laughs> Where? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah. So Ruby first tries to, if you don't put parentheses explicitly, tries to find a constant call, called say hello. But in, can it, in case of this library, in case of this library, this maybe is both a function and it's a class. So it's once again an abuse that probably you don't want, don't want to do in your code. But I think it's just fascinating that, that you can do something like this. Uh, so once again, are these examples that I show you DSLs? Probably not, because they are not real languages. They are just a bunch of random functions tied together. So to make your Ruby code not look like Ruby, to make it more readable. Uh, but I think that it's just amazing things that we can do something like this. Uh, now the question is, should you create new DSLs? The answer is no. Uh, yeah, that's if if you ask yourself, should I create a DSL? Then probably the answer is no. If you see that there is a case where you're so convinced that you want to write DSL, then maybe maybe the answer is yes. So uh, I've been writing Ruby for a couple of years. I wrote maybe two or three DSLs that I'm still using, and in other cases, I just stick to standard methods because even though the DSLs are very readable for you, the author. They are not readable for new programmers, for your users. We have plenty of DSLs in Ruby, in Ruby community. We have like Factorial, we have RSpec, uh, and, and a few more. And some of them are good ideas, 
but any of them, any DSL requires uh, a lot of learning. So to understand R spec, it's not enough to understand Ruby. You, can, you, ha you have to learn R spec separately. And actually, you can understand R spec not knowing Ruby almost at all. Uh, and you can know Ruby very well, but not understand R spec. So that's why I think that DSLs are fine in certain cases, in certain probably extreme cases, uh, but not for, for everyday use. Uh, that's it for today. Once again, my name is Grzegorz. I work for a company called Caligo Travel Solutions. We're hiring, we're writing lots of Ruby code, we're writing lots, writing lots of Elixir code. We use Hanami framework that you heard about at the Red Dot RubyConf. We use it in production. It's awesome. You can join us and check how it works in production. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>